morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending on your time of day or night as you watch this video. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, I'm here with another spiritual insight word still on the topic of destiny, destiny exchange. And today we'll be talking about the topic of being Christian and saved, but at the same time, on the other hand, having your destiny stolen. How is it that someone can be Christian, Bible carrying, church going, saved, born again, and at the same time, that person has their destiny stolen? How is it that this happens? Stick around. That is the topic for discussion today. I'll be giving you some spiritual insight into how this happens and why it happens in the first place and what you can do about it. All right. So let's just get started with the topic of discussion. What does being saved mean? When someone says they're born again, they are saved. It just means that that person confesses with their mouth or has confessed with their mouth that Jesus Christ is the son of the almighty God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the one that was spoken of in Isaiah chapter 53, the one who has taken everyone's sins been condemned for those people's sins, for everyone's sins, including the person confessing this, and that Jesus Christ has went to the cross and has suffered the condemnation for those sins, was crucified and died on, and then he was buried and he rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven, okay? that when someone confesses that and they invite Jesus Christ into their life, they can say that they are saved or they are born again. These are the common terminologies or phrases that people are using, all right? So when someone says they are saved, this is what it means, okay? They have received salvation, okay? So popularly, when this person now is saved they would consider themselves that if anything was to happen to them and they pass away they will go straight into heaven okay that is the gospel of salvation that is according to the gospel of salvation that when someone is saved it means that they will have eternal life they will not perish but they will have eternal life that is according to John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life, okay? So then what does being saved, born again, have to do with destiny? And then how is it that this person's destiny can still be stolen? Well, salvation is what happens after someone passes away. Destiny is what you achieve while you are still alive and living in this world where we are right now, okay? Salvation, gospel of salvation is what happens to your soul after your life has ended. What happens to your soul in the afterlife? Well, you will go to heaven, okay? That's the gospel of salvation. It is concerned with the afterlife, now, destiny has to do with those things that God has written for you in the book of destiny about you before even one of those days came to be. That is in according to Psalms 139 verse 16. So destiny has to do with while you're still alive, before you, your life has ended. Those things that you are to achieve, the package of blessings that are custom made and unique for you and you alone, that God has prepared for you, that is called your destiny. It has to do with you still being alive here, okay? The things you are to experience, the things you are to achieve while you're living here. And then salvation, that gospel is now for after you have passed away, then now your, your soul will be welcomed into heaven. So the two, these two are talking about two different things, destiny, earth, <laughs> and salvation, heaven, okay? And then two different time frames. Now, how is it that someone who is saved, someone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they should also have, how is it possible that their destiny could also be stolen? Or how did it happen that their destiny got stolen while they are born again? 
Let's talk about that in details. Now, Destiny Exchange, the stealing of Destiny, and all of that is work that is facilitated from the kingdom of darkness, okay? That is work that is completed by the kingdom of darkness. Now, when this work is completed by the kingdom of darkness through the help of the practitioners of or workers of iniquity, the Babalawas, the Juju men, the Waganga, Wachawi, Sangoma, and all these types of practitioners, okay? When they are doing this work, they also will do their own assessments and investigations. Now, if somebody is saved, they are Christian, they're going to church every Sunday, they are singing hymns the whole night. But in their life, there are certain things that have not been taken care of. There are certain covenants that are still valid in their lives. And these covenants are tying them to the kingdom of darkness. It is possible for that person's destiny to be stolen. It is possible for that person's destiny to be exchanged. It is that it is possible for that person to live with a stolen destiny for the whole of their life and pass away without ever recovering it, okay? And still be saved. And when they pass away, they will go to heaven because they have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord. It is possible. Before I get into the real, real meat of the matter in this discussion, if you're seeing me for the very first time, welcome on this channel. If you're my continued viewers, my subscribers, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your continued support. I do not take it for granted. I really appreciate every one of you. Now, if you like this type of content that has to do with destiny, destiny exchange, destiny restoration, please go ahead and join our growing family through giving us your subscription. If you feel that the words in this video today will be beneficial to someone that you know, do not hesitate. Just forward and share this video with them, okay? And as you're continuing to watch, just hit that thumbs up button because it helps YouTube with the algorithm so that it can push this video to more people out there. That way, more people become aware of these spiritual insights. Thank you so much, everyone. Now, back to our topic of discussion. The stealing of destiny has to do with workers of iniquity who are facilitating this type of exchange, okay? And when they are carrying out this type of exchange, they are invoking evil spirit at evil altars, all right? So this work is facilitated by the kingdom of darkness. But it is someone who has went there to seek for these services. Maybe they are interested in your destiny. Maybe it's for revenge. Maybe it's for one reason or the other. But someone has went there to inquire about your destiny. And then through the use of familiar spirits, through divination, through astrology, they were able to see what is in your destiny. And then now that person may say they would like to steal your destiny. They would like to have your destiny. They would like to something, some blessing that you have that they are interested in. One thing or the other that leads to the destiny exchange. Now you being a Christian, you being saved, does not automatically prevent your destiny from being stolen. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll repeat that again. You being Christian, you being saved, you being born again, you confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord does not automatically prevent that destiny of yours from being stolen from you. Yes. Why is that? Because a destiny exchange has to do with covenants, okay? Being saved does not automatically cancel existing, pre-existing covenants that you are part of before you became saved, all right? It does not automatically nullify all pre-existing covenants that were in place with your name on them before you became saved, that process is not automatic, 
okay so that is the reason why let us dig deeper into this word now when you were born sometimes not all the time but sometimes your parents were part of covenants maybe they were part of covenants that have to do with the kingdom of darkness they may have consulted one of these practitioners, someone who is working with a familiar spirit, someone who is practicing divination, someone who is practicing witchcraft, someone who is practicing sorcery. One of those things, according to the book of Leviticus, that tells us that we are to stay away from these type of things. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 20 and 21 tells us, stay away. Do not consult with mediums, spiritists, astrologers, those with familiar spirits, necromancers, people that worship idols, people that worship other gods, lest you be defiled by them for it is an abomination to the Lord, okay? So once someone goes to consult with any of these practitioners, they become spiritually defiled. Why? Because that consultation will always, always, always involve a covenant. Because it will always involve a covenant, there cannot be any services received outside of a covenant. It's all within a covenant. That's why people are told, bring a white chicken, bring a cloth that is this color and that color. Bring this type of a drink, bring this and that. Those are articles that will be used in the covenant, okay? So nothing happens outside of a covenant. And if a covenant is involved as that person has went there to receive, to seek and to receive services, then that covenant remains in place until it is broken and nullified. So it could be, it could have been your parents that went there. It could have been your grandparents that visited one such practitioner, especially before Christianity came to the continent, before one of them had the gospel of Jesus Christ and decided to convert and become a Christian. It could be your great, great grandparents. Okay. So in other words, it could be somebody in your bloodline. It could be someone that you share blood with. They are in your bloodline. Okay. You are related to them by blood. When they have went and got into that covenant because they went to seek and receive certain services, that covenant has covered those that are in their bloodline before you were born in some cases, all right? Other cases, it could have been your parents and you were already born, but they went there to seek for services. Still, the covenant they got into has covered their bloodline and you are part of their bloodline. Therefore, you are implicated into that covenant, knowingly or unknowingly. Whether you knew about it or whether you didn't even know about it. Whether you were aware of it or whether you had no idea that something like this ever happened. It doesn't matter whether you agree with it, whether you disagree with it. It doesn't matter. The covenant was made. The covenant was sealed. The covenant is valid. Okay? So, this covenant has you implicated in it. In the records of heaven, in the books of heaven, your name is written under covenant number 11223, whatever the covenant number is, as recorded in the books of heaven. When they look through, they will find your name in it. They will find your name under one such covenant, okay? In the books of heaven, where the angels are recording everything. So what does that mean? That means that because your name is attached to a certain covenant, that covenant is associated with the kingdom of darkness. You are implicated into it. It means that there is a legal right for your destiny to be stolen. And it just means that you are vulnerable for destiny exchange. You are vulnerable to have your destiny stolen. It means that one of your main doors in your house is wide open. Therefore, 
it is just waiting for the destiny thief to walk by and notice that your door is open and they can come in and grab whatever precious things that are inside, which are your blessings. All right. So that is why it is possible for your destiny to be stolen, even though you're saved, because when you got saved, if you did not take care of the covenants that were pre-existing, they will still be valid. What's the point here? The point here is that your being saved has nothing com entirely to do with covenants. So what's the point of being saved? Is it just to go to heaven after you pass away? No, <laughs> that's not the point. Being saved here just gives you the keys. It gives you the access. As Jesus said, I have given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Someone please put that Bible verse in the comment section. Thank you. It means that you have been given a privilege that other people don't have. It means those keys are a privilege. Not everyone has this privilege. You, because you have believed that Jesus Christ is the, the Messiah, the Son of God, you have been given this privilege, all right? You have become a child of God. You have these keys at your disposal. Now, what is the point of having keys at your disposal and not using them? It means that still, whatever destiny exchange has to happen will happen. You have the keys at your disposal, but you're not using them. Is it because you don't know that you have the keys or you don't know how to use these keys? It could be one or both. Either way, you have to use the keys that you are given. When you have gotten saved, your status has changed. Now you're considered a child of God. Now you have the keys, you have the privilege. You have to use that privilege. You have to use your keys, okay? How do you use your keys? It means that those keys, one of the ways you can use them is to bind and lose. Whatever you bind on earth will also be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will also be loosed in heaven. That's, those are keys that you're given, okay? Use them. You can bind the evil spirits. You can bind and lose, you know? You can lose your blessings. You can bind the evil spirits. That is one. Number two, which is very, very important in terms of covenants. This number one I've talked about binding and losing is authority. Okay. You have authority. The second one is you have, you have a legal immunity. You have a legal immunity. All right. Covenants are very legal. It's a language of the law, okay? When you enter into a covenant, it is binding. Therefore, you are tied to the terms and conditions of the covenant. Whatever was agreed upon, you have to follow because the covenant is binding. Also, with every covenant, there is consequences for breaking the covenant, if it is covenant that one of your family members, your parent went to a babalao somewhere, Mganga, to get treatment, they went to get some muti or something, some jujuman or obiawaka, they went to get something, there is some consequences that were told to them very clearly. If you break this covenant, these are the consequences. Somebody will go mad, somebody will pass away, somebody will be sick, somebody will lose all their wealth, this and this and this and this, different things that are consequences. With every covenant, there is a consequence for breaking that covenant. That is why it keeps people in line, it keeps people into the covenant, okay? Now, if you are to break these covenants so that you can be completely free so that that door that door that gives the legal right for your destiny to be stolen can be shut what happens with the consequences of breaking the covenant are you able to pay are you okay with suffering the consequences of breaking the covenant because a covenant is a legal agreement it is binding we say that god the almighty creator of heaven and earth 
the, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a covenant keeping God. He entered into covenant with Abraham. He entered into covenant with Jacob. He entered into covenant with David. He is a covenant keeping God. And he is a lover of covenants. Okay. Now, is God going to break the covenant that your father entered into when he went to visit the Babalao? Because now you are saved. Now you're born again. Is that covenant your father entered into going to automatically be nullified because now you're saved and you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and is the Messiah? No. God Almighty is a respecter of covenants. He is a respecter of those covenants. He will not go and automatically cancel what was legally made at an altar somewhere, even if it was an evil altar. The parties that entered into it were willing parties, okay? And there was a sacrifice. With every covenant, there's a sacrifice, okay? And covenants usually will involve blood. So there was a blood sacrifice to seal the covenant. Therefore, God isn't going to come and just break it automatically for you on your behalf. Jesus isn't going to break it automatically on your behalf, okay? Because God is a covenant-keeping God. He's a respecter of covenants. Despite that, he is the creator of heaven and earth. That means that you have to have confess with your mouth that you want out that you don't want to be part of this agreement anymore that you don't want to be part of that covenant anymore that you're separating yourself from the terms and conditions of that covenant from that moment going forward this has to come from you out of your own free will because god has given each one of us free will to choose between life and death and we shall eat whichever you know we choose we shall eat its fruit its fruit thereof right so we have been given a choice as human beings it is just this choice that you have to exercise being saved does not automatically make that choice for you you have to make that choice for yourself and pronounce it just the way when you were saved, you had to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? Is the Messiah, the son of God. The same way with the covenants, you have to confess that I want out, out of this covenant, out of this agreement. It is not of the kingdom of God. And I and my household will serve the living God. According to Joshua chapter 24, verse two, they are four. I am separating myself completely from this evil covenant and all its terms and conditions. Aha, uh -huh. you have confessed that. What happens to the legal consequences? It said there, whatever, whoever went there was told that if somebody breaks this covenant, there is going to be serious consequences. The person that breaks it may run mad. The person that breaks it may lose everything that they have. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? What happens when you're saved? There is a difference here now. This is the difference, the privilege I told you when you got, when somebody gets saved. When somebody breaks an evil covenant, let's say their parents got into that covenant, they got into it unknowingly or something like that, and they break it. If they are not saved, they will suffer the legal consequences. They will suffer the consequences of breaking that covenant because it is a legal and a binding agreement with terms and conditions with consequences for breaking it. Therefore, they will suffer the cons those consequences, okay? If it is running mad, they will run mad. If it is whatever it is, that is what is going to happen to them because they broke the terms of the covenant. If somebody is saved, they have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now they have access to the payment system. They have access to the cross, on the cross on which Jesus Christ died, the cross of Calvary. The cross has now paid for all the legal demands associated with breaking the evil covenants. 
that is a privilege that is given to those that are born again, those that are saved. Other people who are not born again, other people that are not saved don't have access to this payment system. This payment system was offered by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He went to the cross and with that, he carried all this. The sin itself of going to visit such a worker of iniquity along with the legal consequences of breaking that covenant because every covenant has legal demands that is why in colossians chapter 2 verse 14 15, and 15 it talks about the sins have been nailed to the cross along with the le with the legal demands of those sins because there is the sins themselves of worshiping idols of visiting those evil altars there is the legal demands. Those are the consequences of the sin that are also there. So both of these, the iniquities, the sins, along with the legal demands of those sins and iniquities, all of them are nailed to the cross, according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. So when you confess this, you separate yourself as someone who is saved and you say, I confess this, Jesus Christ have mercy on me. I confess that this is the covenant that my name is listed under. I separate myself from it. I ask for your mercy because the legal demands of this covenant are huge. I cannot bear them. Please, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. I nail it to the cross. Now, the blood that was shed by Jesus on the cross covers the legal demands it wipes away this sin it washes away the sin it wipes away the any afflictions as a result of that sin and iniquity for the wages of sin is death okay but more importantly also it completely pays off the legal demands that means if someone was to run mad jesus has already paid that off therefore you will not run mad for breaking that covenant if someone is to lose everything they have because they have broken that covenant that will not happen to you the saved one because according to colossians chapter 2 verse 14 and 15 the legal demands have been paid for covered at the cross therefore what am i saying here the cross okay, on which Jesus Christ died. That is the payment system that you receive when you got saved. Now, if you didn't know this, what happens? If you didn't know this, that ignorance is no defense. You will suffer the legal demands because it is, it is not automatic. Just like the breaking of the covenants is not automatic. You have to confess you have to confess this sin. You have to confess this sin so that it can be wiped away. It can be forgiven. Jesus is not going to forgive anything regardless of your confession or no confession. You have to confess. You have to repent. <laughs> when you repent, then the payment system kicks in. When you repent, then it is wiped away and the blood of Jesus pays for everything such that you don't suffer the harms. You don't suffer those legal demands associated with those breaking of those evil covenants. Okay, And that way you are completely um, removed from having anything to do with those covenants or the consequences, the legal demands associated with them. When you are fully now in the kingdom of heaven, your name cannot be found under any covenant associated with the kingdom of darkness. Now all these things will be added unto you. Now your destiny cannot be stolen. Your destiny, if it is stolen, is now being restored to you. As you claim it, it is being restored back to you. You have the keys, you have the privilege, you are using it. After this process, in case your destiny is not being returned to you because, you know, for one reason or the other, you can use the authority that Jesus Christ has given to you because he, are, he has also given us authority. Now you can use the authority given to you to trample on serpents and scorpions and all the works of the enemy and no harm 
shall by any means come to you. Because as you trample on the serpents and scorpions and over all the works of the enemy, including destiny, you know, exchange and destiny theft, no harm shall by any means come to you. I hope that this now has explained this a little bit because some people, you know, have been saying it and thinking that they are saved. There's nothing more they have to do. Their destiny can never be stolen and everything is all good. No, you might be very vulnerable because you don't know that there are some open doors in your life. And it's just waiting for the opportune time for that destiny thief to do a scan and place a demand on your destiny. And, and your being saved will not prevent that. How does it happen such that Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 says, A curse causeless shall not land. Are there any people who fit this category? Yes, there are people who fit this category. These are people who have went through that process of ensuring that there are no open doors in the spiritual realm that are making them vulnerable for a curse to land. The process I've just talked about where they have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord. They have removed themselves from any and all evil covenants that have their names associated with them. And they have invoked the blood of Jesus to cover all their sins, wash them away, and the cross to, uh, to be used as a payment system where they have nailed the legal demands of every evil covenant that they have broken. And so they have went through that whole process and all the doors are closed. Now, Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 is applicable to them. A curse causeless shall not land. If somebody even tries to steal their destiny, it is not possible. Wherever they go, to whatever Babalao, Mganga, Mchawi, Mutiman, Obiawaka, Jujuman, whatever they try, that person will tell them that it's not possible with this one. This one, you cannot do it. It's not possible with this one. Che you know, go and look for another person. It is because their name is not associated with any evil covenant anywhere. When they do a scan, they can't find their name listed anywhere in association with any evil covenant. Okay, that is when this applies. <laughs> so we are all hoping to get there um, by the grace of God. It is possible. So when you've gone through this process and you've reached to this level, even the children that you, bo you, you bear, your children will also automatically be in this category. Your grandchildren will also automatically be in this category. Your bloodline going forward will also be automatically in this category. Where if somebody tries to steal your daughter's destiny, it will not be possible. They will suffer the consequences of trying to do that unsuccessfully. It will not be successful because they will have no open doors in the spiritual realm that give the enemy the legal right to come in and steal their blessings or exchange their destiny. It just will not be possible. So when you see certain people for whom this uh, destiny exchange is not possible, it is that one way or the other, they've been through the process where the doors in their life has been shut, okay? They don't have any open doors. Maybe somebody in their family has went through this process and has interceded and this has happened. Because a parent can also go through this on behalf of their child. One family member in their home may have gone through this on behalf of their own family. Someone in their bloodline may have went through this process to redeem their whole bloodline. And they are just, you know, they don't even, they are not even aware that somebody paid this price. They are not aware that somebody went through this process, but they just found themselves that, ha, ah, lucky me, you know, my destiny cannot be stolen. Somebody tried to go and do this. Someone went to an evil altar for me to do this. This is, but it was not possible. Somebody in their bloodline, somebody in their family, somebody, you know, related to them went through this process with them 
being covered as part of that bloodline such that it is they are now implicated under this proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 just the same way if someone in the bloodline someone in the family went to an evil altar got into a covenant the people in the bloodline are implicated into that evil covenant is the same thing that if someone went through this full restoration process and now Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2 is applicable to them. Their all bloodline going forward is also covered. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Shalom. Bye-bye.